<laughs> and preserve the video. Sure. So I want to try to recreate what we talked about, and I have a couple more questions that came in over the week. Okay. So last week we talked about your va your background yep. as a family court attorney. Yep. But you've also been on the other side because you said you have three sons. Yes, I have three and sons. Yep. Right. And you're you're divorced. You went through a divorce. Yep. You share custody with your ex, but you were fortunate enough to have an amicable divorce. And yes. it sounds like Fairly. you also have. You <laughs> As, as divorces are concerned, it was amicable, yes. Right. And you, so you're able to co-parent um, as smoothly as possible. Yes. But, and that's amazing. So yeah. but the thing that stands out to me is that you clearly have this tremendous empathy for those of us in this huge community who um, don't have that same experience and those of us who deal with narcissists in particular in yeah. the legal system. So even though you didn't have that experience, like where did all that empathy come from? Um, the empathy came from my personal experiences and well, it, it's a combination because it started out as, you know, being an attorney and representing people going through divorce and custody disputes and seeing the pain that they were going through. And, uh, quite frankly, even though, you know, I always, uh, worked hard for those people, I never really could grasp just how painful that it was. You know what I mean? Um, I never really uh, understood or could really feel how painful it was. And um, when I went through my own, you know, I, nat I'm naturally empathetic as a person, but still, you still, you know, you still can't grasp it, especially when it's someone that you don't have an emotional attachment to, like a client. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, yeah. I, I was always empathetic, but I didn't grasp the full nature and, and all of the pain associated with it until I went through it. And then when I went through it, it took, you know, basically that the, the natural empathetic qualities that I have and kind of just, you know, blew them, blew them out of the box because uh, it, it clicked like, holy shit, like this is, this is what they were talking about, you know? And um, I, I, I went through a lot of pain, a lot, like I, I had, it was really rough for me. Like uh, my divorce was really rough for me. Um, and I had all of the skills and background needed to, to get through it, you know, successfully. So that's when I started to think, you know, I got to do something. I got to create something for people going through this. I got to share my knowledge. I got to, I got to start consulting with people and coaching people. And so that's kind of where I am now. Yeah. Well, we yeah. are really happy about it because we love uh, your content. Oh, thank you. So another thing that we talked about last week was how many parents feel strongly about protecting kids from an abusive parent, mm -hmm. especially when the kids don't want to go with that person. Yeah. And you gave a really powerful reality check last week. And I just, I had told you um, in a message and I wanted to share it now with you because you haven't heard it yet. Part of a message that I received in response to it. Um, and she, this woman said that your words were thoughtful compa and compassionate in explaining the bottom line and the reality of the tough love nature of the unfair world we live in and the truth of not being able to shield, to shield our babies the way we do for a world that doesn't actually exist. I mean, our kids are already feeling that of course things are off and the situation is not comfortable. So it opened my eyes to stepping out of my own ego even more than I already have to and love my boy even deeper. So I'm wondering, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's awesome. Yeah, that is, that's beautifully written and very, very awesome, very touching. And right, and that's, yeah. that's an, expert, an excerpt. Yeah, so yeah. I'm wondering if you can repeat what you said about how even though it's so painful for us as parents to let our kids go with, with what we consider an abuser, like how do we deal with it? Do we have to do it? Yeah. So well, first off, it's re it's it's comments like that and reactions like that, that that keep me doing what I'm doing. I mean, I know when I first created my program and I had the first few people join my program and I got testimonials from them and I was like, holy crap, like this, you know, this actually resonates with people. It actually helps people. Um, so it, that's the first thing is that's all that's always great to hear. And, and God bless whoever wrote that. You know, I hope everything ends up working out for them. Um, but, yeah, it's you know, when you're in a situation and I wasn't in any sort of a, abuse situation, uh, you know, e either I'm not, I hope you could tell I'm not an abusive person <laughs> either. Um, but, but I've seen many people go through it. So, and I, I, you know, my background in psychology and, and everything I've researched for, 
the past 20 years kind of gives me the, the tools to, to help people through that situation. And um, when you're in an abusive situation and then you decide to finally uh, cut that cord, so to speak, and get out of the relationship and you have had children, you know, with that uh, person. And what happens is, is when, when you get out of that relationship during a custody battle or a legal battle or divorce or whatever, it is, you know, th there's the timing's never bad to leave a relationship like that. But when you're talking about timing from a legal perspective, it's horrible timing because you can then, you know, you finally get the strength to leave and then simultaneously you get the, the strength to actually tell someone about it. Because let's be honest, when you're in a situation like that, you're embarrassed like crazy. So you, you're not only embarrassed, but you're fearful because you're still with the person. So you don't want to tell anybody, right? So you may not have called the cops. You may not have told your mom or told your dad or told your family because you're embarrassed. You know, I, I have a consulting client who actually covered up a relationship that they had with, with, uh, with the father of their child for 10 years. Like 10 years, they covered up a relationship that was brutally abusive and fake, right? Because they were embarrassed, and rightfully so. That's how the process works. That's how it is being a human being. So the timing is horrible from that standpoint because what happens is you finally get the strength to leave and then you finally get the strength to tell people. And then when you, when you do that, people don't believe you because they think it's because you're in a custody dispute and you want your kids, right? So I, I always pose the question in some of my content uh, and with some of my, my consulting clients, is it, is it alienation or is it protection? You know, is it, are you alienating your child from the other party or are you trying to protect them? And that's a line that's very difficult to define and describe to the courts. And it is. And it's just because they look at it the way that I just said. It's horrible timing, you know, because the legal system and results in the legal system in, in, in all aspects of the law, criminal, civil, whatever, a lot of it's based on motive, right? And mm -hmm. you can attach a motive to a person who's claiming abuse when they are just now claiming abuse at the beginning of a custody case, right? So that's first off. The first off is for anybody going through, you have to understand that it's going to be very difficult um, not only to go through, but to prove yourself, all right? So you have to look at it from a different angle, right? You have to um, think, okay, well, this I know this is going to be difficult, so what can I do? How can I do this? And the problem is, is when you're dealing with a, um, a, an abusive situation, you automatically think because – studies show that if they're abusing one person, chances are they're probably going to abuse someone else, whether it be their child or their next, you know, partner or, or whatever, right? Employee, whatever it is. So you, you know that and you, you feel that and it scares the ever loving daylights out of you because you, you think, oh shoot, like what am I doing? How can, what can I do to protect my child from going with this person? And the problem is, is if there has have never been any signs of abuse towards the child or allegations of abuse towards the child, it's going to be very difficult for you to keep that from, from that relationship from moving forward and from happening, right? So then you think, well, shoot, what do I do? What, what can I do? Do I move out of the country? Do I just like leave and like get the hell out of Dodge? Like, well, you really can't. So you need to understand and, and, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for giving children to people who are abusive. Like I would never do that. That's idiotic. But what I said in the last session with you is that, you know, this situation alone, abusive person or not, this situation is one of the most difficult situations anybody can go through, especially the children. So your children are already in a situation that is brutally difficult, intense, confusing. They don't know the reasons. They don't know why it happened. They can't understand it. Um, and a lot of times the other parent or sometimes, you know, you yourself are going to be a, an asshole at one point or another, right? So a lot of times you're worried because you, there's a chance that your child's going to go be with this jerk. And what are they going to do? Are they going to get harassed, abused, manipulated, you know? Are they just going to, like, grow up to be like them? Like, what is it? 
And the truth of the matter is, is, as brutal as it may sound, is you're not always going to be able to protect them from that. Like, you just aren't. And at some point in your life, it might not be until, you know, they're 18 and graduated high school. It might not be until they're 25 and they move, move out of your house. Or it might not be until you're long gone and, and, and you leave this world. But at some point or another, they are going to have to learn how to deal with assholes, learn to deal with difficult situations, learn, learn, like observe people and then understand, I don't want to be that. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's just the way that it works. And we can't, you know, we, regardless of how much, how much love and how many amazing decisions and how many, how much protection we give to our children, we're never going to be able to guarantee how they turn out. Like, you're never going to be able to guarantee it. Like, I always say, I, I was telling uh, Candy, my fiance, uh, the other day, like, as far as childhoods go, like, I probably had, like, the picture-perfect childhood. Like, I have two parents who are still together. Like, there was never any abuse. Like, did they argue? Like, sure, like anyone else. But I, I pretty much had a p picture, picture-perfect childhood. And guess what? Like, I still have a shitload of human issues that we all have. <laughs> Right. So the, the point is, and I actually, I actually had to talk myself through that because at the beginning of, of my divorce, like I was worried sick about my kids, you know, like, what am I doing to my kids? Like, are they ever going to bounce back from this? Like how, and then I'm thinking like, here I am anxiety ridden, stress ridden, questioning everything. And I had like the perfect childhood. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. Like you, we're going, we, we have to, we have to get through it. We have to learn from it. And that goes for our children too. And sometimes, and again, I'm not saying abuse is ever a good thing for a child, but adversity is, you know, adversity is okay. Abuse is never okay. Like it's, it's never okay. Like those people should be dealt with in ways that I can't describe right now, but, but adversity is, is not, it's not a bad thing. You're going to have it. They're going to have it. They are going to have to either see it and either model it or refuse it. You know, right. I mean, that's an opportunity to build resilience. Absolutely. And, you know, people come to me a lot and say like, well, how can I, like if the other side's talking poorly on me or the other side's acting poorly or like, what can I do? Well, the best thing that I always say that they can do if they're in this situation as a parent is to up your game as a parent. You know, if someone's, if, if the other party's talking smack on you or if the other party's the asshole in the group and, and they're real, uh, uh, arguing about everything and, and abusive and, and harassing and whatever, the, fir the best thing you can do is up your game because then your child not only sees that, like, you, you know, a, a child learns more from what they see than what they hear, right? So not only do they see what a good person looks like, but they, they have that energy. They, they get that positive energy from you, right? Whereas if you die, go low with them to try to argue with them and prove yourself right, that doesn't change the energy at all. And, you know, like I think I said on my last, the last live with you, one of the things my dad always told me was don't ever argue with an asshole because onlookers won't know who's who. You know, and it's, it's the same way for your kids. Like it's, a, it's the same way for your kids observing the relationship with you and your ex. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. I know it wasn't exactly how I said it last time, but it's that's okay. are all true. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So someone just sent in a question, do efforts to foster a healthy relationship count? So even though you know your ex is a bad person, you're, but you're showing that you're trying to co-parent well. Yeah. Count well, in yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's this, the, the, the general answer is, the, if, does, that, does that bode well? The general answer is yes. However, obviously, you know, every situation is different, and there are different levels of magnitude of being an asshole, right? <laughs> like, there's just some, like, excuse my language, but there's just some prick, and then there's, like, some actual legitimate, like, abusive mm -hmm. person, you know? Um, and the question is, the balance is, I guess I should say, you know, how, how can you on one hand encourage a relationship and then on the other hand claim abuse, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't really like do that. Okay. But although you might not want to encourage a relationship, you might permit telephone contact or you might, you know, encourage some other sort of contact or something else. So 
depending on the spectrum of, I guess, asshole qualities at where you are, like you're, you're, if, if they're down here, if they're just a jerk, like you, you don't, like you don't have any right to discourage a relationship with that person. If they're just a jerk, if they just make the bad, bad decisions, if they, you know, whatever they do on their own time, if they're just not a person of very good character, like, unfortunately you can't make that judgment. So you kind of have to encourage that relationship. And yes, that does look very good. It's when you get up here in the spectrum of, okay, if I really suspect like physical abuse or God forbid, sexual abuse and physical abuse, um, you know, then what do I do? Well, the answer then at that point is going to be, I hope to God you have experts involved, you know, for forensic psychologist or someone involved so that you can at least say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't want them to be around this person until this professional tells me it's okay. Or, you know, something to that effect. But generally speaking, yes, the, the encouragement, I mean, in Pennsylvania, I think the number one factor that judges look for in a custody case is encouraging a relationship with the other side. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that tells yeah. you like how important that is, right? Yeah. So actually, um, I was going to ask it to you later, but I'll ask you now, a lot of people asked about um, well, first of all, I know that in another of your videos, you talked about why a court won't pay attention to a letter from a therapist. Yeah. You know, we think that's so important and that it's considered hearsay. But yeah. say somebody pays like an expert witness who doesn't necessarily know your child well, but they're an expert in the field or yeah. brings a forensic in, like how much weight does that have in family court, like these paid expert witnesses? Yeah, so when anytime you have a witness, we'll just talk about expert expert witnesses, but this is true for any witness. Anytime you have um, a witness, uh, in particular in this case, like I said, expert witness, the things that the, the first thing that the finder of fact, which in most custody trials is the judge, sometimes there are juries, but find, when I say finder of fact, it's the judge usually in a custody trial. The first, the finder of fact, like, so the issue of, um, competency and credibility are there for every witness right mm -hmm. and it is ultimately the finder of facts decision as to whether or not this person is competent and has credibility right so in saying that you can put someone like that on the stand who just you know is an expert and reviews the situation but you have to be ready for the other side to try to attack the person's competency and or credibility with the fact that, you know, you, you, you've never actually treated this child. Have you, you've never actually done this. Have you, you've only been involved in this case for, um, you know, three months. Ha haven't you, you, mm -hmm. own, you, you got paid by the, the mom or the dad, didn't you? Right. So can you use someone like that? Sure. Can it be effective? Yeah, sure. If if they can answer all of those questions and they're very good at what they do, um, but obviously from a credibility standpoint, you'd be much better off at having someone who is you know um, up to their uh, their neck in 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 the case and has been for a long time and understands all of the moving parts of what's going on. That would be your best case scenario. Unfortunately, I know, and um, uh, you know, and it's no no uh, slight to to psychologists or anything like that. But I know a lot of times, you know, they won't get involved, right? Um, in that's, court, that's not a common issue. Yeah, with yeah, which which you know, sometimes that really sucks because sometimes they're the only person that can really, you know, do anything about about the situation, right? Uh, because if you're the one trying to relay that stuff to the court, then you're, you're going to be either labeled as coaching or, you know, um, the one behind everything or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's a, it's a shitty situation because, you know, I, we don't have that problem in Pennsylvania. Usually the, whoever's involved in treating is usually okay with being involved in the, the court, um, system, at least in my experience, it has been. Uh, but I know from talking to other people throughout the country that that's not always the case. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely not. Yeah. So um, I was also going to ask about how I think we talked a little bit about how being in court, even though you're not physically in court all the time, but when you're involved in these litigious situations, mm -hmm. um, it feels like you're always under a microscope. And so yeah. many people feel like no matter what they do, they're going to get like in trouble or yeah. painted as like the unfit parent especially be with all the parental alienation, like all the power behind that. Yeah. So 
um, you know, a lot of times there's all these false allegations. And I personally will say to people that if you're spending all your time picking through every false allegations, you're like the boxer in the corner with the gloves up getting pummeled, um, you're losing and you're not actually focusing on what matters and yep. judges getting impatient because they don't have time to deal with all this. And I know you have a very simple way on how to handle false allegations, as, well, at least outside of court. And I think it was in the little video of yours that I posted this morning, but can you just repeat that for people watching later? Yeah, yeah. anytime you're, uh, first off, like you said about, you know, all of the, the issues, like you're under a microscope, like that's one of my biggest problems about uh, family court, in particular custody court, is that like, let's be honest, you know, we're, like we're all learning on the fly <laughs> as parents. Like, we we're no no one's like an expert parent until maybe like your kids are gone and you know i i honestly i can't even i i don't even know when you could even make that assessment if you're like an expert parent or like a perfect parent or whatever because we're all learning on the fly and we don't quite frankly we don't know how things that we do are going to impact our child because life is so long right so mm -hmm. and and my problem with it is is that all of those imperfections that we have as parents and all of the crazy ass things that kids do, like we talked about during the last one with like bruising, like my ex and I always used to say yeah. that if we ever like had to go to custody court, like we would probably both be thrown in jail because our kids always had so many bruises from like playing and fighting and like, you know, just being, being crazy little boys. Um, and that's my pro one of my big problems with custody court is that sometimes the point of it is to exploit that stuff. Absolutely. You know, it's to exploit the, the, the imperfections that we have that make all of us who we are, including our kids, you know, like, um, you know, like you hear stories all of the time of, uh, you know, famous people or successful people and they talk about, you know, how they had a bad childhood. And so, and, and things aren't always perfect for people. And, and the problem is that gets exploited completely by attorneys and, and by sometimes by the, the opposing parties. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's disgusting that it happens that way, but that's the nature of the beast. And um, a lot of the times, if you're going through a custody situation, especially with uh, you know, a narcissistic person, uh, one of the tactics that they like to try to use is they like to try to uh, accuse you of, of what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. course, they try yeah. to, so like whatever they're doing, they try to, you know, take, take the, the eye off of them and, and put it on you by accusing you of doing what they're doing. And, um, you know, I, I would always get questions, you know, how do I handle that? Oh, you muted. Can you handle that? Uh, are you, am I, are you good now? Yeah. You went out for a second. Okay. I was like, <gasps> you can see my yeah, face. <laughs> I was getting, a, I was getting a call. <laughs> um, okay. yeah. Uh, when you're getting those false allegations, you know, I always get, used to get questions, uh, about how to handle that. And uh, the way that I coach people to handle that is, is with a simple response, um, you know that's not true. That's it, period. Like, no explanation, no, no clapback, no counterpunch, uh, nothing. And sometimes people will say, you know, well, what happens if they ramp it up? Or what happens if they say, yes, it is true? That's fine. That's it. You still don't respond after that. Like, that's it. You don't, you know... They're, they're uh, you know, a person like that, their most valuable currency is your attention, okay? Exactly. And the thing that you need to remember, not you in particular, but your listeners, the thing that you need to remember is that it's also the other way around, that your most valuable resource is your attention. And the cool thing that you need to, well, not the cool thing, the, the important thing you need to understand about that is, that attention is limited because you're only here. You don't know how long you're here. Like, you, you know, you could be gone tomorrow and you just wasted your most prized resource, which is your attention on someone who doesn't deserve it. So knowing those two things, you never want to waste your, you know, most prized resource on someone like that who doesn't deserve it. And you don't want to give them that satisfaction because what it does, and I, I talk about in some of my videos about training your narcissist like a dog, um, what it does is it's basically like di giving them like a doggy treat, you know, mm -hmm. for, for bad behavior because you're giving them what they want the most for doing something shitty to you, 
right? right? So you just say, you know, that's not true. And that's it. And the only reason why you even say that is because a lot of people get nervous about how, you know, they'll go, the other party will go into court and maybe say like, um, you know, yeah, judge, I, I told him or I told her that she did this or he did this and uh, they didn't even deny it. You know, they didn't even deny it. And quite frankly, if, if, if you and your attorney know what they're doing in court, you're going to be able to get around that anyway. Like that's not enough proof in my opinion, so long as you attack that in court. However, to, to make people feel better then just respond with the, you know, that's not true and don't uh, engage in any uh, further communication with them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know yeah. it's, like that. it's like a type of gray rocking. Like it's a canned response where what are they yeah. going to say other than back and forth, like a baby, you know, arguing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that made me also think about how last week you talked about, um, I can't remember how we got to it, but you talked about something where part of the, the struggle you have with your ex relates to your own sense of feeling like you need to validate your own choices oh, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. relationship. Yeah. yeah. So one of the concepts, um, and I, I haven't, I, I've, I've thought, I've been thinking through this probably for six or eight months now, but I don't think I've actually gone on and actually taught it. I think during our call last week was the first time I ever even discussed it, but I'll be making more content on it. But basically the theory that I have is, is that, uh, you don't, you do not have to hate your ex to, to get divorced and you do not have to hate your ex to get separated. I think what happens is, is a lot of times, you know, obviously these situations are so emotional and you get in these emotional situations and you don't know how to react because you never been, you never felt emotional situations to this magnitude, to sadness and anger and hurt and everything else. So you're questioning, you know, everybody questions when they're in a marriage, you know, no one, no one uh, goes to the altar and, and says, I do and thinks, you know, I can't wait to get divorced <laughs> like this, you know, I, I, I'm excited to marry this person because I want to get the hell out as soon as possible. Like, well, maybe I shouldn't say no one, but most people don't think that way. Right. <laughs> um, so what happens is, is you get in the situation where the writing's on the wall that the relationship's going to end and you don't know how to deal with those emotions, you know, yourself and you're questioning yourself and you're wondering, am I making the right choice? Am I making the right move? And to do, to convince yourself that in the affirmative of those questions, you, you start to learn to and teach yourself to hate that person, to completely hate everything that they do, everything about them, the person you, you spent you know, some of your life with that you made kids with. Um, and, and the, you know, you do that not only to convince yourself, but you also do it to convince uh, your church, to convince your friends, to convince your, your family, your parents, you know, whoever that, you know, I'm making the right decision because I hate this person. And here's why, because here's all the long list of things that they did to me throughout the course of this relationship. Right. Well, the problem with that is, is that, there's two things really. Um, so hate, the, the feeling of hate is a negative energy that will, uh, you know, uh, poison everyone, including the person that feels it. Right. It's like, uh, I think, I think it was Gandhi that said that basically that, that resentment, hate and resentment is basically like drinking poison and hoping that your enemy dies. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's number one, that, 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 that feeling of hate, causes creates this negative energy inside of you that you might not understand it or not but it's changing you as a person and it's changing your life right so that's number one why you don't want to do it and then number two why you don't want to do it is hate is actually an attractor like hate even if you might think hates are repellent but hates actually an attractor and it's because you have to have so much attention on something to hate it you have to be focused on something to hate it Right. right. We talked about love and so, hate being so similar. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just the, uh, the opposite feeling. It does the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you walk down, if you walk down uh, the sidewalk and someone walks past you that, you know, maybe they're a piece of crap person or just a, a horrible person and, and you don't have that feeling of hate, your energy doesn't change at all you're completely fine. You're in, you know, you're, you're, you're walking past, you're not attracted to that person because you're not focused on that person or hating them or whatever. And 
that's the thing that I, I hope more people can see and understand with this whole divorce and custody process. And I, I learned that early on because I actually like, I started like trying to talk myself into, to hating my ex, you know, and I couldn't understand why I was feeling the way I was feeling. Like, you know, I don't really feel that way towards, towards really anyone. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking like, like, why am I doing? And then I was like, Oh shit. I'm like, you know, I'm like actually kind of talking myself into this. Right. And then I was thinking, Oh, well, I bet you everybody does this. Um, and, and I'm not saying like, just because you, just because you're not supposed to hate them doesn't mean you need to like, like them or like, like anything, like, you know, it doesn't mean you need to love them or like them or appreciate them or anything, but good Lord, try your best to, to eliminate that hatred feeling because the energy is going to, to really adversely impact your life. And it's going to keep you attached to that person. It's an attachment, like, just like love is. So, yeah. 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 I always think of it as like the goal is to have that emotional detachment where you just yeah. don't care. Yes. I feel like, you know, luckily I've had that for a long time, but I'm angry at the legal system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that that's, you can hate. That you can, yeah. that that's, you a can separate, hate. yeah that's a separate <laughs> issue. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, um, okay, so another person from the audience last week wanted to know how to decide between a good and bad attorney, and then you started talking about one of my unfortunately favorite topics to deal with is vexatious litigation. Oh, yeah. Remember? Yeah, yeah. So uh, first off, when you're when you're sitting down with an attorney, you know, you want to first you want to you want to be 100 percent clear on their billing practices. Right. Um, you want to you want to uh, make sure that you know what you're getting charged for when you're getting charged, whether or not you're going to have to completely replenish your retainer or just like keep it zero on a monthly basis. You want to make sure how much experience they have, you know. Um, but, but you also, you know, with the topic of vexatious litigation, one of the things that I said, and it's, it, it was funny because I got, uh, the, the, the TikTok video where I talked about it, they TikTok muted it because they said right. I violated, uh, I violated their, their policies or whatever, their, their code or whatever it is. And, um, they muted it. And then I, in the topic, it was one of those ones that like I stitched with someone and they say, like, say something that you're going to get a lot of hate for or something like that. Uh -huh. And I talked about a bunch of different uh, unpopular topics, um, uh, popular topics, but unpopular for the legal system. And right. uh, one of them in particular was uh, vexatious litigation. And, uh, and if anybody watching this uh, either live or on the replay doesn't know what vexatious litigation is, uh, basically, it's whenever, you know, the other party will continue to just go into court for any reason whatsoever, just to basically make you spend money, spend money, show up to court, show up to court. So you finally either go broke or give up and uh -huh. then it's over and then that's it. Right. Um, and I said in the thing, one of the th clips that I said basically was the, the point was that, uh, you know, vex vexatious litigation would be uh, significantly eliminated or completely eliminated if attorneys would step up and, and quit filing stupid shit to just make a buck. And that's the truth because if you, you're an attorney, you know, a couple of my mentors uh, when I was younger um, that I watched both in the family law area and the criminal law area, one of the things that they were always very good at was being brutally honest with their clients, you know, and telling their clients when they were wrong and basically having control of the case and not letting their client control the case. And that's a thing that if more attorneys would be that way, especially with narcissistic people or people who like to do the vexatious litigation thing and the financial abuse thing, then that problem would be significantly limited or eliminated. And um, it's a shame that, that TikTok muted that, muted, the, muted that, but maybe we'll try again to get it out there. But yeah, that's... I I know it's such a huge issue. I think I mentioned when I was interviewing the legal director of DV Leap in Washington, D.C., which is a nonprofit group of attorneys that help on the appellate level with trying to overturn bad court decisions. They said that in America, at least 80,000 people are dealing with legal abuse or vexatious litigation, which yeah. is what I'm dealing with myself. Yeah. And we have a, a group every Sunday that meets that's specifically on legal abuse because it's torture. It's just yeah. torture, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and it happens all along the 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 as like every in every aspect of the law. Like you see it a lot with big corporations. You know, if you ever tried to sue a big corporations, you're gonna get 
paper to death and everything else. And that's the name of the game, uh, which, you know, w from a standpoint, when you're dealing with that, like, okay, maybe you understand that, but when you're dealing with like divorces and, and your kids, like, good Lord, like that shouldn't be allowed. You know, that, that like stick to the, stick to the real shit, stick to the nuts and bolts of the case. And that's it. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I, I I consult. I, I I talk. I had a consult with someone yesterday who's well over a hundred thousand dollars in their divorce. Like it's it's it's, it's mind boggling. I like, know. It's I need to. I got six like million million. dollars. Like you better you better have like a uh, uh, you know a hundred million dollar marital estate or something like that. That like I know. you know what I mean? Like yeah, you know, I, I I knew someone um, who spent six million dollars on just the divorce. Like, just like the divorce, give me a break. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who has that kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when you said about being papered to death, another word for vexatious litigation and legal abuse is called paper abuse. Yeah. But a lot of us um, dealing with narcissists and personality disorders in the court, it's also called stalking through the court because it's the only method they have at this point when we're out of the relationship to still get us is through the courts. And that's how they get the money and the time and attention is having to, in my case, like having to keep going back Yep. to um, to enforce orders yep but um but anyway we also talked a bit about this um movement to start reforming family courts and how um i said like a lot of our clients who are still drowning in their own case are like i really want to be part of the movement you yeah. know me too family court like to rich reform family family court we like we all do but i know that um that for our people like you you're, you should be really like careful with social media in general, and I feel like when you're when you're drowning in your own case, you really have to save yourself and your kids first, yeah. and let someone else carry the torch. And I know you had said something about um, what you think might help actually reform family courts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mean obviously, you know, with family court, there's certainly ways that you can do it as far as um, you know lobbying to to change the laws. And, and, you know, maybe change the education of, of judges and attorneys or, or things like that. But the problem with all of that is you're not, you know, if you, and, and I, I admire people who feel strongly about something enough to try to do that. Uh, but the problem is you're probably not going to be doing anything that's going to be benefiting your case or anybody's case really that, you know, because for all of that to be, um, put into place and then actually have an impact you're talking about years and years and years and years and years down the road right still still beneficial and i'm certainly not discouraging anybody from doing it um but my point is with family court that if we truly wanted to change family court overnight um what it would take would be basically an honest effort for every single person that's involved in the process, that's the parents, the grandparents, the, the, you know, the judges, the, the CYS and CPS and the guardians ad litems and the attorneys and, and even the children, you know, in some cases. And, and what it would do would be to, for them to all do their part in self-evaluation, right, and self-reflection and accountability, and if you can, if it, and you might, you know, someone watching this might be saying, well, you know, well, I already do that and it hasn't changed anything. Well, yes, yeah, because the other side hasn't done it or because the attorneys in your case haven't done it or the judges or whoever. If every single person would do that, admit where they're wrong, admit their issues, fix them or try to fix them and grow, it, we, it, it would change overnight because, the, the, you know, there, the finger pointing would be gone. Right. The finger pointing will be gone. Everybody will be taking responsibility for their own actions and and the need to, to litigate and the need to spend countless amounts of money on attorneys um, would be gone. Uh, the yeah, problem, we have no family yeah. court. Right. We have, peace. we have world peace if we had that. Yeah, you wouldn't. If you just acknowledge if everybody just acknowledged that er nobody was perfect and none of us are perfect and all try to grow through it and understand where our weaknesses are and understand the impact of what we're doing has on our children, then it would eliminate the need for, you know, $20,000 retainers and everything else. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have a couple of little quick questions now yeah. that I forgot to ask last time. Yeah. What kind of impact do criminal records have on a family court case? A lot of times there's like something else going on and like our people are like, what about, you know, he's done this, that, and the other thing. Like how much impact? Yeah. Uh, so I, I always like to say that for a criminal record, there's two different things that you want to look at as far as relevance and persuasiveness go for that particular crime. And that is the content of the crime and the timeliness of the crime. <laughs> so what was the crime? Was it just, uh, you know, a DUI or, you know, underage drinking? And then the next question is, when did it happen? And the less severe the subject matter of the crime, the, the less severe, then the closer in time that you need. So okay. the lesser the crime, the closer the time the stronger the crime the further the time so okay. if you're talking about like a sexual assault mm -hmm. or you know uh, sexual assault with a minor or something like that well then sure if that happened like five or ten years ago then yeah that's still going to be relevant right at least you, you you should be able to make it relevant whereas if you're talking about a dui that happened 10 years ago probably not that big of a deal if you're talking mm -hmm. about a dui that happened three nights ago you know, and the, the kid was in the car or, you know, whatever, then probably a big deal. So from general standpoint, that's the issue with a criminal record. And then the, the kind of uh, secondary uh, subject is the credibility of the person. So anytime somebody testifies on the stand, one of the things that you can do is you can bring up, this is for courts that follow the rules of evidence, you can bring up crimes of someone who's testifying on the stand, even if they're not a party to the case, but they have to be crimes related to dishonesty. So like theft, forgery, you know, um, uh, different things like that. Um, so that's the other issue with, with crimes when they're relevant is if you, you know, if someone takes the stand and they have a crime of forgery or, or theft or larceny or grand theft auto or whatever your crimes are, then you can bring those up because what they do, what you can do then after you bring those up is you can then argue that the person is not uh, credible and that the judge, you know, should not believe what they're saying. Okay, great. I'm thinking about this now, like towards my own situation with seven mm -hmm. years in the legal system. Um, so when you said that, I was thinking something like perjury on paper yeah. in family court seems completely meaningless. And that my question is, why don't judges, no offense, but why don't yeah. judges actually enforce orders? Like I have three contempts on my ex, another one on the way. And in two different states, every time we move or, or you know, I try to get the attention on it, they, there's another lawyer who comes in and distracts from the issues and they, they won't actually enforce contempts. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the reason is I, I like, I usually like, you know, as an attorney, I, I would basically kind of classify judges, <laughs> um, which is an important thing, which I actually have a YouTube video on about the mindset of judges, because what I would do, and this is a long answer, but I'm going to explain it to you. What I would do is I would try to get a read on that judge's mindset, what was important to them, what made them tick, what triggered their ego, what, mm -hmm. you know, pissed yeah. them off, because then I would use that stuff for my client, right? Uh -huh. and, and it's very important. If you're in a case, start doing it. Start you know, not only, you know, wondering what you can say, but start listening to what mm -hmm. people are saying in the courtroom and how the judge is reacting to it, right? And two of the, cla two of the classifications that I would give for judges um, would be uh, basically uh, a judge, uh, 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 a no-nonsense judge, right? So you have your no-nonsense judge who doesn't put up with shit at all and takes control of everything. That's and then what you I have want. Yeah, and then you have the judge that you're referring to, which I always, I would always like to call the can kicker, and they just kick the can down the road, right? Yeah. They, they kick, kick the can down the road, and you would probably find Fine. that with those judges, they were one of those types of people that wanted to always try when they were younger and growing up to have everybody like them. Right? I was just about to say people pleaser. Yeah, yeah. They're a people pleaser, and... So they don't want to make a decision because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and they don't want to upset anybody and they're a can kicker. So instead of making a decision and maybe making the wrong decision, you don't always make the right decision, 
but make a decision. They kick the can down the road and hope that the issue is either forgotten about uh, or resolved. And the best way that I could say to deal with that would be every time that you go into court for an issue like that, when you're on the record and politely, but remind the judge and stack the, the history. So, uh, you're, you know, Your Honor, just for the record, I want to just remind you that we were also here on, you know, April 17th of this year on this same issue. And we asked Your Honor to, uh, you know, whatever you asked them to do. Um, you know, to impose sanctions uh, on Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. Um, and, and, and no sanctions were imposed, and now here we are again, you know, two months later with the same issue. And then when it goes to the next one, you know, Your Honor, just want to remind you we're here on April whatever and, and you know, June yep. of whatever, and, and we asked for sanctions. We did not have sanctions. The activity is still going. The kids are still being harmed this way. And just continue to do it and, and continue to stack it each time. And hopefully they eventually quit, you know, pull their head out of their butt and quit trying to kick the can down the road. I know. Uh, I know. I've, I've been doing that. I've been doing that. It's working really well. I have yeah. great orders. Yeah. I just need enforce, like someone actually needs to enforce them. But, but yeah. it's true and you're right. And I'm glad that you said that. Yeah. All right. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to keep you on forever, but I want you to have the opportunity to talk about your merch and your program. Yeah. And I really yeah, so do I think that you should get your thing on the house. Oh, this great. Here, not today, Mark, uh, with the <laughs> Judge Anthony logo on it. So, yeah, I have uh, – this is – we're in the process of creating a bunch of different things. This, this was just the first round. Uh, uh -huh. So I have hoodies. I have uh, coffee – not today, Narc coffee mugs. Um, you got to get the hat. Yeah, you're right. You yeah, you're right. I hat. will. And when I do, I'll, I'll send you a thanks. <laughs> <'Cause you're Hey. laughs> um, good. Yeah, the the phone cases, T-shirts, hoodies, and coffee mugs. And then I have a, uh, um, a program, Custody Case Mastery. It's a phenomenal program. A lot of good people in that program. And it basically works through, you know, all of the areas, uh, the pillars of success that I like to talk about in any custody case. And those pillars of success are your mindset, your communication uh, style, your preparation, and your ability to present and persuade, you know, on the stand and in court and out of court, too. And the theory is if you can master all four of those, then you're going to find success and peace, you know, in, in court and out of court. And along with that program, I have a private uh, mastermind Facebook group that people are in, and that way – people can kind of be immersed in it and learn from others and help others. And, you know, and I go live in there uh, every other week and um, I have that program. And then uh, another thing that I actually just released, I think i mentioned it to you during the last call and I just released it uh, yesterday is a new uh, free masterclass that I do. It's how to beat a narcissist in custody court. So you can finally have some peace. Oh, where and, can people find that one? Yeah, they can find it um, on the, uh, uh, at webinar.judgeanthony.com webinar.judgeanthony.com and um or it's on if you're if you do follow me on tiktok or on instagram it's in the uh, link in in my bio on both of those platforms will take you to all of my links for all of that stuff okay great so, yeah all right awesome so yeah. i'm done and i am cool. so like grateful that you agreed to do this again sure. i'm really careful to save yeah. it to the phone and not just try to post oh, it you know what? i actually meant to screen record it and i totally forgot so i hope it works <laughs> yeah. hope All right. well my partner chris is recording it on another thing well, so okay, good. Good. i will Perfect. definitely send it to you and not mess up this time and thank you so Perfect. much for, for your time again you're welcome absolutely right. thanks for having me all right talk all to right, you later care. all right bye-bye